Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, I, it's a little bit rainy outside, so we're going to try to get through this while also not succumbing to the weather. Um, uh, today, we're going to be talking about alcoholism in youth and what does that look like. So uh, this will be a presentation by me, prevention educator Ruth Del Pino. Um, so I, not that you don't know who I am by now, but who I am is I am a prevention educator for the Mercer Council on Drug Abuse and Alcoholism. Uh, I never get that right. It is the Mercer Council on Alcoholism and Drug Addiction. My apologies. Um, I have a Bachelor of Arts in Global Studies, Political Science and American Studies. I'm certified in teaching English as a foreign language, life skills training and leadership. So that's where I'm coming from. Uh, I always start my presentations with this just because I feel like it's it's necessary to preface uh, a lot of these things. Um, and this is that it's a presentation, but it's not meant to scare you. It's meant to inform you. This is also not a parenting class or a way to deal with children. It's advice, but you are the best parent for your child. You know them the best. You've known them longer than they've known themselves. So there's that. Also, my perspective is shaped by my approach and by my learning experiences. So that means that my perspective is shaped by what I interact with on a daily basis as a prevention educator, as well as any other empirical evidences that I find and put into my presentations. Also, this is evidence informed and some evidence based. So that basically means that I collect a lot of information. I collect a lot of empirical evidence and a lot of, um, and I pull from a lot of programs that I am also certified to teach in. And um, I put them in the presentation because I know that they are scientifically backed. So we're gonna get into the presentation now. Um, and if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat. Also, if you don't want uh, your face to be presented in um, the recording of this video, you can change your name and turn the camera off. So first off, uh, why this uh, presentation, we are going to be talking about alcoholism. And so why do we have marijuana legislation in New Jersey on here? So um, this is relevant because the marijuana policy uh, that was just passed, that is now a law as of February, 2021, um, they had passed it and there was something about alcohol in it. And a lot of people were intrigued. They were like, well, uh, this is about marijuana. Why did we slip in alcohol? What's going on? And a lot of people had thought that the relevance was uh, the intersection between um, people using marijuana and alcohol and treating it the same way. So um, it, this uh, where there were a lot of discrepancies uh, in this marijuana legislation, and some of them were surprising, some of them were not so surprising, um, and some of them were just plain weird. Uh, and this was one of them. So one of the major discrepancies was that it originally said that if a youth was caught with alcohol or marijuana, if they were warned, parents or guardians of that child would not be notified of the first encounter. Um, I believe, uh, from my understanding, it was after the third encounter. Um, and uh, now it has been revised so that the parents are notified the first time that the child is caught by law enforcement interacting with alcohol. Um, and this was revised because of the outcry, but this was also revised because this, this is something that is necessary. And also depending on the age of the child, this could have happened multiple times, or this could have been the first time. And the, the um, level of interception is also very important to know. Um, if you are wondering about alcohol um, and just in general, I found a wonderful resource. It's called alcoholproblemsandsolutions.org slash New Jersey alcohol. Um, and this is, I actually went through this website with my nieces because I wanted to know how much they knew. They are 10 and 13 years old, so they really didn't know a lot, but it is actually a really good resource and kind of fun to go through with your family. So you ask, like, it doesn't have to be a drill. It could be sort of like a quiz style where you ask, what are the minimum age laws? Um, you know, what happens if you have a false ID? What about selling alcohol in certain places? Um, they have a lot of uh, cited cities in here. So they talk about Atlantic City. They talk about Pittman, Riverton, Winoa, Wildwood Crest. So all these places that are really big party places for people to understand that when you go, here are the discrepancies. Here's how you should be interacting with alcohol. It also talks about buying alcohol and the different types of fines, uh, depending on whether or not you buy alcohol for a child under the age of 21. Um, it talks about uh, driving in alcohol, driving while intoxicated, uh, obviously illegal in uh, all 50 states, but uh, it is something to be addressed. It talks about penalties when you are 21 and older, penalties when you are 21 and younger, and it talks about first offenses, second offenses, third offenses, um, driver's rights, as well as field sobriety tests, 
open container laws and boating and alcohol, which I didn't know was a thing um, because I don't own a boat. But that is good to know um, about the different uh, aspects of boating and alcohol, which I didn't know that was, you know, um, something of concern, but they actually call it operating under the influence, which um, is new to me, but uh, very exciting. Also, um, if you are looking for particular resources when it talks about New Jersey laws, um, they have a bunch of resources here, legislative information, Supreme and appeals courts, uh, drug court information, and it brings you to all those places. Also, it connects you with um, lawyers that you may need to seek out depending on your situation um, and to protect you and understand your rights as a New Jersey citizen. So a very, very cool resource, um, I thought. Uh, so we're gonna be going from there. Um, all right, so what are the usage rates in the United States? Yeah, so the, we don't have a lot of, um, there, there was some New Jersey statistics, but I did wanna uh, have it as a United States usage thing so that we could understand the context in which New Jersey youth are socialized in. So alcohol, um, vade, uh, alcohol usage, uh, drinking patterns varies by age and gender, meaning that um, it depends on what time of your life you're in and also the way you're socialized as a gender. So whether or not you identify with one or the other, um, it can change how you interact with your environment quite differently, actually. So alcohol use often begins during adolescence and becomes more likely as adolescents age. So you start at 13, you drink something, and then the usage just starts to increase from there. In 2019, um, there were quite a few different studies by the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. And what they had found was almost two, and I'm gonna throw some statistics out there. So I just want everyone to be, to be ready uh, to listen to some numbers. And a lot of these numbers will be cited in the resources and also in the video description below. Um, so in 2019, almost two out of 100 adolescents aged 12 to 13 reported drinking alcohol in the past month and fewer than one in 100 engaged in binge drinking. Among respondents ages 16 to 17, fewer than one in five reported drinking and about one in 10 reported binge drinking. Now we're gonna be talking about binge drinking a little bit later and I will define that uh, later for anyone that doesn't know or is, is uh, slightly unaware of what that actually could mean. Um, but this, these numbers show that it's really important to implement prevention education strategies so that that number could be even lower. Uh, one in 100 is not a lot, but it can also say that of that one in 100, if you have a thousand people at one school, 10 of them statistically will have drank alcohol under the age of 21. And that is something to uh, understand as well. Historically, also adolescents and boys were more likely to drink um, at this given time about 20 years ago, according to statistics and uh, a lot of surveys. But they had actually found that the reverse is happening now, that girls are more likely to drink um, than uh, boys in this time frame. And what we have sort of noticed is that there could be a lot of reasons for this. But more specifically, it shows that um, I have a video on females and drugs. And what I had really understood was that a lot of um, a lot of females, especially, used alcohol as their choice of drug and men cho chose marijuana as their choice of drug. There was, a, there was definitely a gender discrepancy there. So what we have noticed is that more that marijuana is becoming legalized, um, more about marijuana becoming more accessible, more mainstream, more normalized. Um, a lot of men are making their way towards marijuana versus alcohol and women are starting to make their way towards alcohol versus marijuana. Um, which is very interesting um, and just something to put out there and to understand. Um, I have a lot of underage drinking statistics, but I do want to talk about social media definitely playing a part. So I, I want to pose a question. What approach are they going to have when they are constantly exposed to controlled advertising? And I do touch upon this in another video called Subtle Advertising with Prevention Educator um, Amy Argirio. And what we talk about basically is that the interaction with advertising really does play a role in the way that children interact with their environment, the way that they interact with substances, and the way that they interact with essentially, you know, uh, the most mainstream drug branding, which is alcohol, because cigarettes, you know, you really can't, uh, you know, advertise the same way as alcohol. So I, um, I was really uh, interested to see how it would play a role in social media. 
And social media does have a new platform for marketing. And in the 2019 study um, with the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, uh, they had found about 24.6% of 14 to 15 year olds reported having at least one drink in 2019 in general. And in 2019, 7.0 million young adults ages 12 to 20 reported that they drank alcohol beyond just a few sips. Now, this is concerning um, just because uh, we, we want to know what the numbers look like, but also that um, social media does play a huge part in this because they, I also cross-referenced um, a study conducted by the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse, and this was done at Columbia University, and found that teenagers who regularly use social media outlets, so this includes Twitter, Facebook, Discord, Instagram, Snapchat, and that's just some of the social medias that exist out there right now. The survey asked about 2,000 adolescents about their drug use and social media habits, and 70% said that they use social media on any given day, so that's a really good majority. And researchers found that compared to those who were infrequent or did not use social media as much, um, they were five times more likely to buy cigarettes, three times more likely to drink, and two times more likely to use marijuana. Now, I just want that to stick into your brain so that we know where uh, we're going to approach some of this dialogue later on. But th those are numbers um, that are definitely concerning, but also not surprising because of the normalization um, of, uh, of substance use disorders, but as well as uh, using marijuana and alcohol as a recreational purpose to sort of socially lubricate a lot of experiences. Now here on the side, I do have a picture. Um, oh, my apologies. I do have a picture um, and it talks about women in general. And uh, I do just wanna just look at this very quickly because it does, uh, alcohol affects more women than it does men, but that doesn't mean that either gender um, doesn't have uh, more akin to a substance use disorder, but there is an underrecognized problem among women and girls. And this is by the CDC Vital Signs. And this was uh, the study that was done in January of 2013. So nearly 14 million US women binge uh, drink about three times a month. Um, that is a big percentage, that is a big number, um, and that's about one in eight. So that's, that's kind of concerning. Um, one in five high school girls binge drink, meaning one in five is 20% of high school girls, um, and women average six drinks per binge. Now, a lot of the time, this is sort of normalized by wine culture, um, saying, oh, I'm stressed out, let's just have a glass of wine kind of thing. And so that really does perpetuate some of that as well, considering we are using um, drinks to supplement a lot of the stress that women may be feeling on a given day. Um, so those are numbers also to keep in mind. I do have here um, more than 95,000 people die from excessive alcohol use in the US each year. This encompasses drug driving as well as alcohol poisoning and alcoholism. So I do have a video um, and we're talking about the teen brain and the alcohol uh, and how alcohol sort of affects the teenage brain. Um, and I want to talk about uh, the formation of the brain first, just so we have some context. So um, as you can see here, uh, there is a lot of different uh, pictures of the brain, but the, the bluer and more purple it becomes, uh, meaning there is less gray matter to be formed, the more um, like solidified your brain becomes. So five years old, it's pretty malleable. There are a lot of different things going on. And the older you get, the more um, your brain tends to have uh, less gray matter. So there, there's more of a formation there. So it's much more solidified, meaning a lot of your synapses, a lot of your neurons, all of the connections that you make, all of the learning experiences that you have, those are all stored there. And at any point in any given interaction before the brain is fully formed, it runs a risk of being deformed and it runs a risk of being rewritten by substances that are entering the body and interacting with the brain. So the brain sort of, um, I do talk about this uh, in my video with uh, Vanessa DeRosa, who is Protecting You, Protecting Me Prevention Educator at the Mercer Council. And what we had discussed was that the brain sort of uh, forms from the back to the front. So the back is where it starts to form the most, and then slowly it starts to creep up towards the front, meaning that the last part to be developed is the pre- Prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is the place in which a lot of decision making is made. This is where a lot of the impulse control happens. So I don't know about anyone else who had any high school friends that were a little bit um, 
how do you say wild? And um, you had uh, people that were like, you know, I'm going to jump over a fence right now, or I'm going to run across the train tracks, something like that, where they're like, that's not safe for you. And you know, that's not safe, but you're saying yes anyway. And that is the result of the prefrontal cortex, not necessarily being fully developed, that your decision-making skills and your ability to control your impulses isn't there yet. And we're going to be talking about how alcohol plays a role in that decision-making process. So here we go. Adolescence is the transition from childhood to adulthood, encompassing a period of major physical, emotional, intellectual, and social change. Our brains also change considerably during this time. The developing brain is a learning machine, and from when we're born, it grows enormously as we learn more and more about the world. This means we end up with billions of connections in our brains, but many of these pathways are either too slow or not needed. It's during the teenage years that our brains are renovated, whereby most of these unnecessary connections are removed or pruned away. At the same time, the connections that are kept are insulated to allow for faster communication across the brain, a process called myelination. Pruning and myelination occur gradually over the teenage years and are greatly influenced by our experiences and interactions with the outside world, including the alcohol and drugs we choose to take. Let's take a closer look inside the brain. The frontal lobes take the longest to develop. By about 25, they've become your center for decision-making, helping you to plan and organize, focus your attention, control your mood and behavior, and solve day-to-day -day problems. The temporal lobes are like an information processing center that builds your library for sounds, speech, learning, and memories. The cerebellum integrates your senses, helping you to balance, control, and fine-tune your movements. The hypothalamus is involved in many functions, including the release of hormones that help regulate your temperature, hunger, thirst, and sexual development. And the brainstem is like the final checkpoint for information going to the body from the brain and vice versa. Alcohol affects the teenage brain differently to the adult brain because it's still developing and not all areas are fully operational. How you feel when you drink alcohol can be an indication of the damage it's doing to different areas in your brain. Alcohol affects the frontal lobes first, making you feel relaxed and reducing your inhibitions. This means you may talk more freely, act loud or rowdy, or do foolish things you later regret. As you continue drinking, your brain starts slowing down, reducing your ability to concentrate, make good decisions, and control your emotions and impulses. This means you might do things you otherwise wouldn't. In the hypothalamus, alcohol blocks the hormone that tells the kidneys to reabsorb water. This means more water is lost as waste. Reducing the amount of water available to the brain makes you dehydrated, which explains the headaches and body aches you may experience the next day, otherwise known as a hangover. Alcohol's effect on your cerebellum is evident when you lose your balance and fall over or have difficulties with standing and walking. This is why injuries are so common when people are intoxicated. Drinking alcohol particularly affects a part of the temporal lobe called the hippocampus, which enables us to form new memories. Alcohol interferes with the transfer of information from short-term memory to long-term memory. So if you drink heavily over a short period, you may experience a blackout, meaning the next day you can't remember what you said or did. Drinking at a level that causes blackouts means you're also much more likely to do something you wouldn't usually do, and your friends may not be aware of how drunk you really are. During your teenage years, you need to look after your brain to keep it healthy just like other parts of your body. Our scientists are learning more about the brain all the time, and research has shown that the damage alcohol does to the developing brain is not only short-term, but may be permanent. Look after your brain. It's the only one you've got. I actually love that video for a lot of reasons, uh, but more so the visuals are 
um, extremely uh, like they they hit a different sort of wavelength there, where the where the graphics give you a really clear picture of what the brain parts look like, but also how the alcohol interacts with the brain and it's digestible in that way. If you did notice, um, the accent was Australian. So this is an Australian channel on YouTube, but they give very good information. And a lot of their information is the same as anything that we have in the United States. And a lot of their statistics do look the same um, when it comes to usage in teens. So it is still a very good resource and I highly recommend it. Um, and this will also be a link for the channel um, below in the description box. Um, so we're going to go from there. Oh, this always happens. Okay, here we go. Okay, so um, when it comes to uh, alcohol, um, excuse me a second. When it comes to alcohol, what does an alcohol substance use disorder look like? So alcoholism and substance use disorders uh, don't necessarily look the same. And I just want to talk about the discrepancy very quickly. Um, alcoholism is a disease that happens uh, due to the addiction that you have. Um, addiction is a step in a substance use disorder. So a substance use disorder can, can happen in stages. So you have five stages here. A substance use disorder can happen at stage one, stage two, stage three, and so on. Um, so that means that just because you have a substance use disorder doesn't necessarily mean you are addicted, but it can also be the same uh, depending on what level you are at with a substance use disorder. Um, so they can be used interchangeably, but the substance use disorder talks about more of the nuances of the steps leading up to that addiction. Um, and as I said before, um, I did have a video that I made about females and drugs. And I do want to preface saying that females do have a harder time when it comes to alcohol um, for a lot of different reasons. But more specifically, it does deal with the fact that one, females are more heavily medicated uh, in the United States. Two, um, females have a stronger dependency system on drugs that enter their body. Excuse me. And three, they're more likely to use alcohol just in general. Um, so it does look different for males and females. Um, and that is something to be aware of. Um, and also binge drinking um, in terms of how much women should have. It would be four drinks uh, in a given a small period of time, usually an hour. And for men, it's five drinks. So the way that the alcohol is processed in the body is actually very different as well. And at the same time, I do preface in the video saying that alcohol, especially when it's measured in a man's body versus a woman's body, um, even if they're given the same amount of alcohol, women are more likely to be drunk because of the systems that uh, exist inside of a woman's body versus a man's body. So that's also something um, that, that could be cause for concern, but also could sort of play a role in risk factors. So we're going to be talking about um, a substance use disorder uh, dealing with alcohol. So um, this is sort of what, what it would look like uh, in teenage um, in teenage years um, and in general with humans, you know, the way that we interact with the world. But stage one is occasional abuse and binge drinking. So occasional abuse really just means that where, you know, maybe once a month you go out and like go a little too hard. Um, you drink uh, quite a lot uh, in a given uh, small given period of time. And it, um, if that becomes more frequent, uh, that means that you reach stage two, which is increased drinking. So stage one would be like going to a barbecue and getting quote unquote hammered um, at, because you're binge drinking and you keep reaching into the uh, the um, cool box or the, the refrigerator for, you know, um, Long Island iced teas or anything like that. So um, it starts from there. And then the increased drinking could be two to three times a month where you um, you know, are invited to things and you keep saying yes. So this could be um, your uh, children saying yes to going to people's parties, saying yes to uh, going to barbecues, um, drinking secretly at family barbecues, things like that. Stage three is uh, problem drinking. Um, where the child uses this as a coping skill um, and they replace all medicines and social interactions with us using alcohol as a solution. And I sort of said this before, if that alcohol kind of does act like a social lubricant where um, you, you kind of forget your inhibitions, you um, have more confidence, you are able to embrace the world a little more because the alcohol strips away a lot of that insecurity. And so um, they may use this because one, they may want to fit in, two, they may just become dependent on it, three, it like, they like the way it makes them feel. Um, so it really does act like a coping skill and it sort of evolves in a coping skill. Um, stage four is alcohol dependence, meaning that you have to function every day with it. There is some, there has to be some alcohol in the day uh, for it to be present. Uh, this is not as harsh as addiction, um, but this does mean that your body is slowly becoming dependent on something like this. 
um, because you you interact with the world and you decide that alcohol is a place or alcohol is a substance that you use um, to interact with the world. It's something that that helps you with it. And stage five is addiction where your body makes the decision for you. This is the stage in which it is very hard to break away from. And this is compulsive behavior and you will want to do anything uh, for uh, to get your next fix or to get your next uh, your next drink. So this uh, up until stage four, slowly over time, um, you're 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 making the decision. And then when it comes to stage five. Your body completely makes that decision. There is no ifs, ands or buts about it. And it is very, very difficult to fight off this type of addiction. Alcoholism is a very hard disease to um, break away from. And I do have a cycle here because a lot of people um, use a lot of different misnomers when it comes to alcohol. So alcoholism is dependence or addiction to alcohol that has developed. Casual drinking is a few drinks with friends, maybe having wine with dinner, something like that. Um, alcohol abuse is a pattern of drinking excessively and despite negative consequences. So a lot of the time you see alcohol abuse in college, alcohol abuse in you know um, high school parties and things like that. But eventually um, a lot of people tend to grow out of that, but those that don't tend to develop alcoholism. Um, so what is alcoholism? I do just want to define this a little bit more because there are some, um, there are some misleading facts about what alcoholism may mean and what, what alcoholism looks like in teens um, because it is a little bit different and because they are socialized differently and their brains are different, this is really important to address. So the Mayo Clinic definition is a chronic disease characterized by uncontrolled drinking and preoccupation with alcohol. So that basically means that drink, that you wake up, drink, you have lunch, drink. Sometimes you replace meals with drinks. You know, that's sort of what it looks like. And a lot of people ask, I've had people ask before, can teens really suffer from alcoholism? And the truth is, of course, um, there's no way that any youth uh, is, um, is sort of uh, written off as not drinking alcohol or written off as saying, oh, they don't have a problem. They're just having a couple of sips. So the problem here is that um, a lot of people ask, why is it not more of a problem? It's that the assumption that children will grow out of it is there. So if you start uh, drinking at the age of 17, that's, that's kind of better than starting at the age of eight, but that also means that you have quite a few given years before your brain is fully developed and your brain could truly become dependent on the substance you're using before your brain is fully developed. And there was a study that said, if you start using um, any sort of substance uh, before the age of, at the age of 18, uh, you are 25% more likely to um, have a substance use disorder. If you start after the age of 21 using substances, then you are 4% likely to develop, to develop a substance use disorder. So really it's about harm reduction. It's making sure that when you drink or when you decide to use a substance, you are putting it off as long as possible. So you're giving your brain that fighting chance. So I do wanna go back to why is this not more of a problem? Well, it, it is. Um, there are a lot of different ways that it is a problem, but I would say that um, if you're if the teen is in a household where alcohol really isn't present, then that's a good thing. Um, where alcohol is treated as a space where it's for adults, you put it away. They, you know, they uh, know what alcohol does to the body. They're educated on it, and they can decide to say yes when they're much older or the legal age for that. And those are all things that are important and a conversation to have with your children um, and with children you work with. Uh, there are some physical signs with teen alcoholism um, and. Uh, this this is just a, a, a small list and the physical and emotional um, uh, signs that exist aren't necessarily the only signs that exist so we're going to open with that right so some of the physical signs are they smell of alcohol um, that's a dead giveaway they smell of alcohol on their breath they have bloodshot eyes slurred speech uh, fatigue um, deteriorating physical hygiene and grooming. So maybe they took a shower every day and they're slowly starting, starting to take a shower once a week, once a month. Um, those are the sorts of things that uh, really need to be addressed. And also um, if they are, you know, let's say for example, there's someone who puts on makeup and all of a sudden they've decided not to wear makeup anymore. Um, that doesn't mean that they are drinking, but it does mean that's a behavior change um, to be addressed so that the physical outside sometimes does represent the inside. And to sort of have that conversation will be really important. Um, and also if they are building up a tolerance that results in drinking progressively more over time. So 
if they have a tolerance for drinking. So for example, you've noticed um, you know, uh, teens talk or the youth talking about their interaction with alcohol. And they say, yeah, you know, I just downed four beers and that's not normal. But you notice that la like three months ago, they were only able to have one beer. Um, you know, so the, the progression of that tolerance is something to be addressed as well and to make sure that it doesn't get to that level. Some emotional signs, um, this is not by any means an exhaustive list, um, but are they irritable? Are they yelling? Are they angry? Are they sad for no reason? Do they have more anxiety? Are they more depressed? Um, have they changed their friend group? Are they shy? Now they're outgoing. Are they outgoing? Now they're shy. What's the, what's the flip on that personality trait? Um, and a change in personality really is something to be addressed um, if you suspect any sort of teen alcoholism going on. Um, I do have a, um, a picture here about uh, effects of heavy drinking on the teen brain. And uh, these images show that a heavy drinker doesn't activate the same parts of the brain as easily than a non-drinker. So um, this uh, really talks about memory storage, um, impulse control, ability to function and things like that. Um, and it talks about uh, the formation of the brain and making sure that is uh, there is much brain matter as possible for there to be present before um, the age of the brain being fully solidified. Um, if you have any questions or concerns, once again, you can put those in the chat. Okay, here we go. We're going to move on. All right, so I also have another video um, talking about youth binge drinking, and this is something that I did want to address because binge drinking doesn't necessarily happen with just youth. So binge drinking really is a time for people who are at university. Um, so this is between the ages of 18 to 21. And that statistic about being 25% more likely to use alcohol if you start using at the age of 18 or younger, that, that's something really important to recognize and to to understand. Um, and I will be talking about normalization uh, when the video is over. So here we go. Oh, this is also from Canada. This is a Canadian report, but it is still relevant to um, the way that youth interact with alcohol here in the United States. Let me make sure, here we go. A new school year brings events on and off campus to give college and university students a chance to mingle. A lot of those first year students have also just reached legal drinking age, but some already have experience with binge drinking, which is considered four to five drinks in a two hour period. I did once and I'll never do it again and it was not fun. I'm out here just for academics, I try to have a good time as well. I think after frost week everyone's going to buckle down and it's not going to be about partying, it's about school. Binge drinking. Um, especially during these first week of, weeks of school when students are moving out, living on their own for the first time. Experts say one problem is young people are more sensitive to the initial euphoric effects of alcohol, which makes them more vulnerable to binge drinking. And the results go beyond risky behavior, alcohol poisoning, or blacking out. It could lead to damage to brain function, liver disease, hypertension, even stroke. The report in pediatrics suggests children as young as nine already have positive ideas about alcohol and parents and doctors need to start asking them questions. In Canada, intervention guidelines are in place, but family physicians don't always act on them. And it's effective. The difficulty is getting them to use it. In British Columbia, they've started allowing doctors to bill for doing this kind of intervention. And the, even then, um, this limited pickup. Recent statistics suggest alcohol abuse among young Canadians is declining, but more than half of young adults still exceed the recommended daily limit on drinks. And alcohol remains the leading cause of death among Canadians under 30. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, so um, I just thought that was a very telling um, present uh, video for a lot of reasons, but more specifically, what I had found was that um, there, basically Canada um, has a different reported drinking age than the United States. And this was something I wanted to address that because um, Canada has a more of a open sort of uh, like, I, I believe it's 19 in most um, provinces. Uh, I, some of them are 20, but um, point being that 
that age discrepancy does make a difference. And a lot of the time, uh, what I have noticed when talking with teens was that when the drinking age is 21, and once you reach 21 and over, the sort of um, the newness of it, the uh, sort of salaciousness of it kind of goes away. And that is something that is uh, interesting and concerning for a lot of different reasons, but more specifically, that there's a lot of forbidden fruit syndrome going on. So if they're not allowed to do it, then they might want to. And that sort of can be the um, mindset when you are allowing children to drink in your own home and making sure that they're safe, taking away their car keys and things like that. But also understanding that brain development plays a huge part in the way that uh, children interact with their world and the way that teenagers interact with their environment. So making sure that their brain is fully developed is a huge part of that process. Um, the role of social media is extremely important, as I said before, um, and this is not something to be taken lightly. Um, this is something that uh, is of true concern because social media really does normalize a lot of those things. I have talked in, in nauseam about uh, TikTok and its interaction with drugs and substance use disorders, so I can link some of those videos below, um, but that is something uh, to, to understand. Um, so also I do have a, I did have a video on desensitization and youth and what to do about it. And this is sort of the kind of the same thing where social media desensitizes teenagers, especially to understanding what uh, substance use does to their bodies, but also understanding that marijuana and alcohol really aren't that bad for you. That's sort of the, the preface that the a lot of them are seeing, especially when you have policies that sort of open up that door for things to be less punitive. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing, but what it does mean is it sort of adds another layer to that discourse. Um, and I discussed desensitization in youth in that it's not just marijuana, it's not just alcohol. There are a lot of things they're becoming desensitized to, including COVID, mass shootings, marijuana, alcohol, any sort of substances like that, because of the frequency in which they are introduced to it, because of the frequency in which they're interacting with that information and that material. So it's not just social media, it's media in general that normalizes a lot of violence, normalizes a lot of substance use disorders and things like that. So it is something to be of concern and it is something to understand and understand vulnerable populations while we're having this kind of conversation, right? So if you have people of color, if you have Black Indigenous people of color, um, if you have LGBTQIA plus people, these are all populations that should be um, a lot of those resources and a lot of that understanding and a lot of that desensitization should be mitigated to make sure that they have a fighting chance and making sure that their brains are fully developed and functioning uh, so that they can interact with the world in a very positive way. All right, <clears throat> moving on. Um, and we have here, so what are the risks? Um, there are a lot of different risks when teenagers are drinking. And um, this is also that uh, your teenager may not be someone who was addicted to alcohol. Your teenager may not be someone who was addicted to drugs in general, but if they use it as a coping skill, um, that is still something of concern and alcoholism in teens does exist. So this is still something to address. One, bad decision-making. Um, I, I think that's pretty crystal clear in understanding what that means. Prime to say yes to other drugs. So when you are uh, incapacitated in some way, um, you are more likely to say yes to things. And this also means that you're more likely to say yes to other substances. So you, you may hear the term cross-faded, which um, a lot of the time refers to people who are high and drinking and becoming drunk or becoming drunk and becoming high at the same time. Um, so that in itself is of concern because um, a lot of people think that if you have one uh, sort of drug that stimulates your body and another drug that depresses your body, then they cancel each other out and that's not really how it works. Um, and the chemical reaction of that is actually something that I will show uh, later on in this slide. Um, they are also uh, um, at risk of forms of assault, whether it's physical, emotional, and sexual. Um, this is of true concern because of people who may um, be much more predatory in their actions, but also um, society at large, making sure that violence against women and men is mitigated. And uh, we're still working on that as a society. But until then, this is a risk that a lot of people are facing, especially young girls. Um, sexual activity in general, sexual activity without protection um, is a really uh, a big risk factor. So making sure that um, sexual activity uh, with protective factors in it is present. And when you are drunk and un not able to fully understand the activity you're doing, that's 
that's really cause for concern. So making sure that sexual activity is mitigated as well. Um, motor vehicle accidents slash drunk driving, uh, making sure that you um, are in a space that is comfortable, safe, and understanding your environment, and also making sure that you're not behind the wheel or any of your friends aren't behind the wheel um, is a really important part of uh, a lot of the life skills training that I teach the teenagers that I interact with. I'm also binge drinking. Um, we kind of alluded to binge drinking before, but binge drinking is a huge part of that um, of that sort of uh, that that sphere of uh, risk factors, um, making sure that they're not drinking more than what they what their body would actually be able to handle. Um, the Addiction Center, um, which is a great link to talking about addiction in general, um, talks about a lot of the risks too, where there's um, brain damage, which can be a huge part, car crashes, sexual activity. Um, gender differences and making sure that uh, you're not mixing any sort of uh, substances. So this video in itself is a, a YouTube video that I did with a uh, Vanessa DeRosa, who is the Protecting You, Protecting Me prevention educator at the Mercer Council. And um, I'll, she is talking about prescription medication and medication in general and how it interacts with alcohol. Because this is something for cause for concern because it is a space and this is a society where a lot of teenagers do take medicine, whether it's Adderall, um, opioids, uh, maybe for chronic pain, things like that. So this is also of concern. People that have uh, pain and acute pain use. Uh, most people, you know, just stick to Advil and Motrin, um, but opioid is meant for people that really do suffer uh, throughout their bodies in a very acute way. Okay. Great. So we, yeah, we wanted to <coughs> include this slide um, to discuss this, and it's an especially deadly combination: opioids and alcohol. Um, both affect the brain stem to slow breathing. So a lack of oxygen equals organ and tissue damage affecting the brain first and the damage may not be reversible. So in the picture on the right, it shows um, when on the top, it shows when no drugs are present. So there's a balance of those excitatory and inhibitory signals, which we uh, viewed in the video about how al alcohol affects the uh, developing brain. So, um, so again, there's a balance when no drugs are present, there's a balance of excitatory and inhibitory signals which means that breathing is at an appropriate uh, controlled rate. Um, and then on the picture on the bottom is um, a picture is showing the under the influence of alcohol or opioids. So there is, an, uh, there is no balance, it's out of balance. So alcohol decreases excitatory signals and increases inhibitory signals as we, um, as we um, learned in the video. And opioids make neurons less responsive to the inhibitory signals. So it's good to um, touch upon that as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, and the lack of oxygen, you know, uh, does cause a lot of concern, right? You don't want something, you know, taking away or, you know, adding tissue damage. So especially when you have a developing brain and you have alcohol and opioids interacting with it, it can be a deadly mix um, because it really uh, tends to rewrite some of the parts of the brain that you really don't want to be rewritten and you don't want to be damaged. Um, and especially if it's not reversible, that's something that's really concerning, right? Okay, so um, it's still a little weird uh, seeing my presentation and sort of um, seeing it and seeing my face and also seeing it on here. So um, still getting used to that. But uh, my words, especially, were just saying, and Vanessa's as well, saying that when you have uh, underlying conditions, when you have underlying parts of the body that still are developing, um, drinking only adds to some of that uh, damage that could be done. And a lot of teenagers are taking uh, mood, um, mood disorder uh, prescriptions so that when they are using another drug and it interacts with their body, it can be a huge cause for concern. Um, and so a lot, I hear a lot of uh, questions about um, parents and guardians and people working with children asking, what can I do to help? Well, uh, the first thing is be involved in their lives. Um, I know that's uh, kind of uh, harder said than done. I mean, easier said than done um, because you just want to be a part of their daily life, understand what it looks like, understand where maybe intervention may be needed monitor any changes in behavior, um, such as I said before, are they showering less? Are they not putting on makeup? Are they, um, you know, not engaging with their friends as often? 
also be open to questions. So when uh, a lot of people ask questions, um, I think that asking questions is very important parts of communication, but also understanding that if a person were to come up to you and just ask a random question, would the assumption be that they are considering it? Maybe, but not necessarily. So a question in itself is not proof of action and making sure that when they ask questions, you are very open in the way that you respond with them, giving them resources and understanding what that means. Um, and because you are open to questions, that really does mean that they are able to come to you for things. They are able to understand that you are there to help them. You are there to make sure they are living their best life and that you are not going to judge them if they ask, hey, you know, what does marijuana do to the body? Or, you know, what happens if I drink more than I'm supposed to? Sort of that sort of thing. And also know the right people to call, right people and places to call. So if you have resources and you know resources and you have people, make sure that you interact with that information to make, to um, mitigate a lot of the misinformation that may happen because uh, we don't know everything, you know. So just knowing that you have those resources and that information is a truly important part of that conversation too. Um, I know this sounds weird, but know what their room looks like. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not saying invade their space. I'm not saying that you should cross boundaries. But what I am saying is that know what their room looks like in that, does it seem like they're hiding things? Does it seem like they're rearranging their room a lot to make sure that you don't see what's going on? Um, these are the sorts of things that, uh, you know, can be really hard to, um, to uh, infiltrate, but it is also something that could be very uh, rewarding and possibly intervene with a substance use disorder. Um, also, um, have hard conversations. Um, not just about alcohol, not just about drugs, not just about substance use disorders, but about everything, making sure that you are having hard conversations so that one day, if it is a really hard thing, they can come to you for it so that they can be protected and you can mitigate that risk factor. Also, leading by example, um, for example, uh, you know, having a drink possibly in front of them is obvious is fine, you know, but not saying things like, oh, I'm so stressed, I'm about to have wine. Um, it's wine o'clock, or oh, I'm, you know, I just I just need to take a Xanax to calm down. Like those are the sorts of things that that language normalizes in people's brains to see whether or not it is normal and acceptable to do that behavior. So, you know, um, they teenagers are socialized by social media, but just in the same vein, they're socialized by you too. Um, any interaction that you have, all the examples that you give, these are the things that they are searching for, that they are looking to, that they are using as reference for any sort of substance use disorder that may be going on in their lives. Also talk about substance use disorders that run in the family. Is there any addiction that runs in the family? Is there an uncle, an aunt, a cousin, you, anyone? Is that the sort of thing that happens in your family? And if so, what kind of genes are there? You know, um, what kind of examples uh, did you grow up with? Having those kinds of conversations can be hard, but they can be very rewarding. Um, and I'm going to close this presentation with a quote. Um, and it basically says, we know from research that early childhood is a critical period, said Jane Lanigan, an associate professor of human development at Washington State University, Vancouver. What we've learned is that adolescence is a second critical period. So early childhood is basically ages zero to four, give or take. Um, and that basically means that the brain really needs to have a lot of good stuff in it up until that point. And if not, all of a sudden, it's just like a, like a fail, you know, if you don't do everything right. And, that, and that's not true. And that's basically what uh, Jane Lanigan was saying, that they are learning that adolescence, the time that youth exists right now, ages uh, five to 18, five to 19, these are all very important ages, very important ages for children to understand how the world works, how to interact with it, and what that means for their bodies. So um, I just wanna end it on that and thank you for being here. Um, and I also really liked this, uh, this sort of brain picture model. So I, I put it in there as well, just so we can understand that teenagers, yes, they might be drinking, they might not. There are so many things going on. And to understand that they are making the hardest decisions of their life at the times that their brains are still developing. And that's something to be of concern too, to give them the tools to understand what that means, to give them the tools to understand how to interact with their environment is an extremely important part of uh, helping bring up children too. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your concern. 
Um, and I will hopefully see you next week.